I'm Jennifer Smith and I'm Melva Jones and we are Women's Health in Black and White. It seemed to only make sense that we talk about racial disparities in, in healthcare right. right now. Yeah. There's so much going on in the world. I, I can't believe in 2020 we're still talking mm -hmm. about race, but we are. Yeah. And um, there, you, I can't be blind to color. Mm -hmm. If I'm blind to color, I am doing an injustice to my patient. Right. So what we need, I, th I think, my, in my humble opinion, is to be able to talk about race without the vitriol, without the anger, without mm -hmm. putting your own history into it. Right. That's the as part much that's as possible. missing. Like, there needs to be, you know, conversations. Like, yes. That, that's the only way that we are going to be able to get past this. Um, people have to be willing to talk about it, be mm -hmm. open to it. Is it is a controversial topic? Of course. Will things get heated? Yeah, but I mean, the only way we can ever make some type of progress, in my opinion as well, is you have to have open conversations about it. And be willing to listen. Right. Without an agenda. Without, and listen without just having a rebuttal. I think that's where a lot of this gets mm -hmm. lost. It's like, Absolutely. people aren't listening, they're just like, but, and so we have to take that but part out and just listen mm -hmm. um, and try to process what the other person is saying. And then, you know, that's how you have the open dialogue about it to try to fix and change some things. Uh, just to give you a little background, I was raised in Leeds, Alabama, and then lived in New York for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, Leeds was about 70-30, 70% black, about 30% white. I was the minority. And I, in, in all honesty, can tell you that I didn't know that race was still an issue when I was a kid. I don't remember race riots. I don't remember, I played with black kids and white kids. I, I don't remember it being a problem. And maybe it was just because I was insulated right. and unaware. But the first time that race was an issue in my life, I was a teenager and I was living in New York. And there was, we were looking for a house in New York. And our real estate agent, we would say, this looks like a great house, this is what we need, it's mm -hmm. the right size. And the real estate agent would say, oh, you don't want that house, that's inner city. Right. Well, we were not looking in New York City. We didn't know what she was talking about. Mm -hmm. So we went and drove through the area. It was a black neighborhood. Right. I, I don't know where they got inner city. Yeah. But we also went to that grocery store and found all the things that we needed that, that we hadn't been able to find. <laughs> um, you know, you can't buy okra in New York unless you go inner, inner city. city. <laughs> um, so... I'm surprised they even had okra. The, the guy didn't know what it was. Yeah, the sales clerk didn't, I was just say, that's didn't know what it was, but you could buy it. You could I buy just it. think of that as like a southern type of thing. Yeah. So the house that we eventually settled on was um, close to where Dad was working. That's why we picked it. But it was mostly a Portuguese Italian area. Okay. Not there was two black families in the entire town. Right. Um, there was not very many Irish families, and it matters there. Yeah. It, you, you're not just you're not just black or white. Mm -hmm. I was Irish, okay. and everybody made sure I knew it. That you knew. Um, so, I mean, I, we, I was still kind of the minority because everybody was aware that I was Irish, and that was that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, but we were, my daughter and I were driving yesterday, and we were listening to the soundtrack of Hairspray. Uh -huh. And she said, I wish my high school would do this again. Our, our local high school just did it a couple years ago. Right. She would love to be in it. And I said, my high school would never have been able to do this play. <laughs> there weren't enough black there weren't kids. Enough. <laughs> I mean, we just we had like three black kids, and only right. one of them was in theater, and right. there just there just weren't enough black kids <laughs> to do this show. Um, but I remember when we moved back here, mm -hmm. as as diverse and accepting as the North is supposed to be, right? That's not the experience that I had yeah. there. My experience there was that everybody is something. Mm -hmm. That something is very specific, and you don't like everybody else, right? And in the South. I guess maybe I knew I was Irish, but it wasn't a big deal. A big deal, yeah. And and I didn't I didn't feel a lot of racial tension as a kid. Now I did as a teenager when mm -hmm. we moved back here. I was much more aware. Right. Um, my sister and I went into a, a shopping a store like a like maybe a Kmart. I can't remember mm -hmm. what it was on Memorial Drive in Atlanta, which right. is kind of a black neighborhood. Yeah. And the security guard followed us around the store the whole time we were in there. Mm -hmm. And I thought. 
So this is what that feels like. Right. I was just going to say, <laughs> usually it's the opposite, but, yeah. But it was, a, I think, a good experience for me because mm -hmm. I had never had it that happen. Your eyes to and it. it did. Right. It really did. I thought, oh my gosh, I, this is so weird to be yeah. a, I haven't done anything. I haven't said anything to mm -hmm. anybody. Why is he following me around? Yeah. But it was because I didn't belong in that store. And that's kind of like the misconception a lot of people who aren't black are like, well, they're only following people who look like they might be suspicious or mm -mm. someone who has a hoodie on or someone, you know, it's like trying to cover their face or looks sneaky, but that's not the case. I mean, I've been following a store. It doesn't matter. It's just it's, if you're black, it, it does happen. Not saying it happens in every store or every black person has experienced it, but more so than not, you, you know, if you know a black person or have, are a black person, you have experienced that at some point. Um, and, you know, it, it's not as, sometimes it's subtle, um, and but you do, you feel it. And so a lot of times it's hard to just kind of navigate being a black person. Like, it doesn't matter if you're smart, it doesn't matter how you dress, how you look, how you talk. There are just some little things that will happen and you're like, okay, that happens because I'm black. Like, <laughs> like you're just like, oh, there's okay. no, okay, that, they're doing that because I'm black. Um, and so, you know, we do face that a lot and it's something that, you know, black people aren't talking about all the time because it's just something that happens. And it's sad that you grow up like, well, this is how it is. Mm -hmm. um, but that literally is how it is. Like Jennifer's mentioned up north, you know, you're black, you're white, you're Italian, you're Hispanic, um, you're Cuban. Down here, you're black or you're white. Like, <laughs> it's no, like, it, you're either black or you're something else, but that something else is still better than being black. So it's kind of like, if you're raised in the South, you're definitely exposed to it yeah. um, from a young age. You do notice that difference. I will say, I didn't grow up with any Hispanics or Asian families. Mm -hmm. Did you have Hispanics and Asians around when you were there? Uh, very few. Yeah. You know, like you said, if, if it was any, I'm trying to think, like elementary school, mm -hmm. maybe a couple families, nothing like a huge demographic. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was, you know, as I got older, you started seeing more different types of racial groups and things like that but as a young child yeah black or white <laughs> it really was that's it really what it really was, was black and white, white. <laughs> literally so in healthcare, one of the issues that we run in that I run into a lot is that every subgroup mm -hmm. has different issues right and sometimes those issues are genetic yes um, just because you're a black woman, mm -hmm. you have a higher risk of having hypertension and heart disease. Yeah. Now, my question, my, what I was curious about was, is that because you're black? Mm -hmm. Or is that because of the, the stressors placed on you because you're black? Right. And that's something that, you know, I've been thinking, looking into, too, and I've had this conversation with other healthcare professionals. And a part of it, I do think, is genetics because genetics do play a big part and but the other part as far as like the heart disease the hypertension i do feel like that is a stressor type mm -hmm. thing you know because as a black woman clearly i can speak when i'm black um so it's not you like you know in case you hadn't noticed but so it's not like i'm going by like a general that like i actually know like as a black woman there are you know some stressors that i feel are more prevalent than other um races and it's just one of those things where you know you're as a woman in general you're always taking care of everybody else you're always taking care of your yeah. husband your kids your parents and typically as a woman in general no matter what your race is you put your health and stuff on the back burner and it, it's just kind of a little bit, I feel, intensified as a black woman because, you know, we're taught to be strong and you can handle this and, you know, you don't have to go to the doctor for every little thing. Um, like with depression and stuff, that's not really talked about heavily in the black community. It's becoming more prevalent now. People are more aware of it. But, you know, back in the days, it was just like, you're having a bad day. You might feel sad today, kind of like you'll be better tomorrow, get over mm -hmm. it. Whereas other races are kind of like more willing to go get help and to talk about it and get 
on medication to help kind of stabilize that. Um, whereas in the past, in the black community, we were just kind of just, yeah, it's okay. We'll we'll get over it. We can deal with it. And I think that does have a lot to do with these issues because a lot of them are amplified by stress, your blood pressure, mm -hmm. your diabetes, um, those type of things. Will stress increases how you. Um, handle those type of disease processes. So I do think, you know, stress and genetics play a part in that. Um, and I think that healthcare providers don't ask about right, that. Right. Um, it is just, it's something I've just noticed in the past maybe two or three years mm -hmm. that when I treat a patient for postpartum depression, yeah. she's almost always white or his, or, um, Asian Hispanic. Yeah. It's very rare that I have a black woman come in and tell me that she's depressed. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking, I was precepting another midwife and I yeah. was talking to her about postpartum depression and I said, it's very prevalent and we don't ask about it as often as we should. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the reasons that people don't come in and tell us about it is because you're supposed to be happy. Right. When you have a baby. Yeah. All the TVs and movies and all the stories tell you that you're supposed to be blissful oh, yeah. with a newborn. <laughs> well, let me tell you, new, newborns are not blissful creatures. It is hard. They're, it's so it's hard, hard. And you're so tired. Oh, yeah. But a white woman mm -hmm. will come in and tell me about it. Right. And a black woman very often won't. Won't. Mm -hmm. And if I don't ask, I don't find out. Exactly. So it's been, it's, it's been a goal of mine I mean it was always a goal of mine to make sure I ask every woman but it has been a, it's been an even more important goal in my mind in the last few years to yeah. be sure that I ask my black patients how are you emotionally because I, I feel think, like they're not getting the support that they need right I think that's very important to at least as a healthcare provider to open that dialogue because like I said a lot um, of black women will not readily admit that there's a problem because even if they do share it with others or friends or their family, it's like, oh, you're just tired or, you know, it's a newborn. You're going to feel that way mm -hmm. because you're not sleeping and it's, you know, a, a new change in your life. Um, but it is important to recognize that that is an issue and people, you know, in those positions, healthcare providers or nurse practitioners, doctors and stuff like that, if you do ask, it does kind of give like a, so she's asking, I can it gives you say permission. something about it. Yeah. Yes. And you feel like you have that support. So that that is one way, I feel like a good way to combat it. And just be open. Like, it is okay to have postpartum depression. It is okay to get treated for it. It does not mean that you love your baby any less um, or you're a bad mother or you're unfit to be a mom. Um, raising kids is hard. And mm -hmm. those hormonal influxes after a baby yeah. is ridiculous okay like well and sleep deprivation right changes who we are it does it really does i'm a, I'm a numbers person mm -hmm. so i did look at some studies about racial disparities in healthcare, okay. and one was thirty five thousand five hundred and forty two women of every race mm -hmm. and, and they broke it down but i didn't write the breakdown yeah it was something like 33 percent black and 16 percent hispanic and maybe five percent asian and the rest i guess were caucasian mm -hmm. they were asked about uh, it, it was women who had, it were either pregnant or had just had a baby, <clears throat> and they asked about a, a ton of questions about their health, yeah. about what they were taught during their prenatal visits, mm -hmm. about how their delivery went, and about the stress of being pregnant and, and other issues. And they factored for things like education yeah. and socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. So they, bro they broke all that down, too. How many women were college-educated? How many women had a two-income house? Right. How many women... Um, were able to afford childcare, you know, that kind of thing. It was very thorough. Right. And when we looked at the stress reported by each of these women, because they were asked about a bunch of different stressors, I was, um, I was amazed at how much more stress was reported mm -hmm. by the black women in this study than by the white women, the Asian women, or the Hispanic yeah. women. They were 24% more likely to report emotional stress. 35% more likely to report financial stressors. And, and I'm talking about the women who had a good job, plenty of income, and the women who were on public assistance. Right. They, they all had emotional, uh, financial stressors. They were 83% more likely to report trauma during their pre pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And that some of that was domestic abuse, some of that was car accidents, it was all kinds of trauma, but some, they were 83% more, more likely wow. to report physical trauma yeah. during their pregnancy. 
and 163% more likely to report partner-related stress. Mm. And this was self-reporting. These women filled right. out questionnaires. Yeah. So it's not like they had somebody in front of them and they were saying that they were self-reporting. Right. What was going on in their pregnancies. I was amazed. Yeah. At the way the stress impacted them. Mm-hmm. But we see it in their pregnancies. Right. Black women, regardless of socioeconomic status or education level or whether or not they've got a partner that's involved, Mm -hmm. are at a more than 40% chance of having a morbidity happen during their pregnancy. Like hypertension. Like diabetes. Mm -hmm. Like uh, preeclampsia. You're much more likely, if you're black and pregnant in this country, Mm -hmm. to have a problem than you are if you're anything else. Right. And that's something that we as healthcare providers need to be talking about. Mm -hmm. And we need to be trying to figure out why and how to fix it. Yeah. And I think it just goes along with, like I was saying earlier, there, you know, most of the time, you know, unless somebody specifically asks those type of things, it's not going to be reported. So with that study, a questionnaire, that's kind of like a safety net. Okay, like, you know, I can report this, nobody, I won't feel that judgment. I really think that's probably one of our biggest factors in the black community is feeling judged or you know Mm -hmm. it's not safe to say how I really feel because I don't want others to think of me in a certain way but you know when it comes to your health and especially pregnancy pregnancy amplifies everything um you have to be honest with your healthcare providers if they don't ask and there's something going on just you need to be open and honest and and tell them I mean because it can greatly impact your outcomes Absolutely. and improving your outcomes if you're honest about, you know, what's going on. Like Jennifer said, a lot of times, especially hypertension, especially in the South, um, those issues... Well, we deep fry everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, we deep fry everything. We eat all the... It's good food, you know, but it's, it's real, bad real for us. Food. Um, and so, you know, you'll have a lot of women in general, but especially black women are like... Oh, you know, it's just a headache. I probably mm-hmm. didn't get enough sleep, or yeah. maybe I didn't drink enough water today, or my job just really stressed me out today. And they're kind of not associating with, hey, your blood pressure could have spiked today, or mm-hmm. it's going up. So those are kind of things that we, as black women, need to be more in tune to, listening to our bodies, and knowing that having a headache every now and then, yeah, everybody's gonna have one. But if you're constantly having headaches and your vision is kind of blurry. Mm-hmm. You don't don't just attribute that to oh I'm getting older or I'm just tired. Like those are definite signs, especially during pregnancy, that you're like going towards the the danger signs mm-hmm. of hypertension or preeclampsia. And I often think sometimes um, a lot of black women we just kind of push that under the rug just to keep I don't have time to go to the doctor day. Yeah, you know, I gotta go pick the kids up and need to make dinner. Mm-hmm. Um, that type of thing. So. You know, I feel like that's why, one of the reasons why black women do have a higher morbidity, um, especially, you know, during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Um, Absolutely. Those are just things I feel like more education on um, in doctor's offices, more providers asking specific questions to kind of open that up. And then as a patient yourself, you kind of have to advocate for yourself too. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you're not comfortable doing that or you might not have the education with that, you know, I always tell people to kind of like find a nurse or a healthcare provider like we're everywhere. Right? <laughs> and, That's what I was gonna say you too. know, if you are not comfortable or you don't know the signs you should be looking for, you can, outside of COVID, you could take somebody who's more knowledgeable about it to your appointments with you. Um, or to go over it after an appointment or before an appointment, like, hey, I've been feeling this way. Should I mention this? Mm-hmm. Um, just to kind of, if you're not comfortable with your healthcare provider, kind of bounce it off of somebody else who might have that knowledge. I think that would kind of help too. But to find a healthcare provider you're comfortable with, right? That is very important. It's, it's, it is such an inservice. It's such mm-hmm. an injustice, right? To be going to somebody and putting your health in their hands yeah. and not be comfortable right. enough to. Talk to them. Yeah. So if you're not comfortable with your OBGYN, your primary care physician, mm-hmm. your kid's pediatrician, find somebody else. Yeah. There are way too many to just be stuck with one, even if it's, well, my family, all my family uses this person, my friends use that person. You have to find the right fit for you. Right. Um, right. Find somebody that doesn't treat you in a condescending manner. Mm-hmm. Find somebody that listens. Find somebody that asks the questions. Yeah. You... 
are your own personal healthcare guardian. And having a partner in that that helps you and that is sensitive to your needs and that is listening to you yeah. is one of the most important things I can possibly suggest. Right. If you are interested in what we've got to say and what we have going mm -hmm. on here, then find us on social media. We've got a Facebook page and Instagram and Twitter. Twitter. We have a, a podcast that will be going out called Afterglow that where we talk a little more informally and we would love to have you like and comment and subscribe. Tell right. us about your healthcare issues mm -hmm. and your concerns. Tell us about your experiences with your healthcare providers that were great and tell us about the ones that weren't. Right. We want to know. Yeah. And be safe and well. Be safe.